has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all I know the old man knew. When I met you, you called my chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, or my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see. Good morning. Let's sing together. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His past. Worship and bow down. 
Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, and the sheep of His hand. Good morning, church family. My name is Paul Ritter. This is my wife, Donna, and our newest edition, Peyton. Whether you're joining us online or in person as a member or a visitor, we'd like to welcome you to worship and let you know a few important things. First, please pull out your phone. You may have noticed some QR codes that are placed around the building. Using your camera app, you can focus on the QR code and it will take you to a link to our church website. From there, you're able to check in, submit prayer requests, and get more information. We're going to be sharing communion together as family and friends, so now it's a good time for you to get your supplies ready. Additionally, if you'd like to do a contribution, you can do that online, in the back of the building, in the blue boxes, or at the church office. We're happy to have you with us. Let's continue with worship. Good morning, church family. My name That's the beauty of technology. Sometimes it works, sometimes it just makes you look funny. So, I look funny today, it's okay. <clears throat> Let's stand together for the next couple songs. We've waited for this day, we gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. Your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. A mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we
Spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One Dear Sovereign God, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning first and foremost thankful that we can come together as a family, that we get to see each other face to face today, that we get to shake hands, hug, be a family with each other. Father, we have missed it so much. We're just so thankful that we're having this time again. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us through the Holy Spirit, continue to let the Holy Spirit guide us in all the things that we do. Let it continue to transform us, to make us better than we are. Always keeping in mind the, the great sacrifice your son made and how when we were sinners, he forgave us. He, he, he died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. Father, we know that there is so much work that needs to be done. So many people that need your hand on them and that we are your tools here on this earth. And Father, we pray that you will give us the strength and the desire to be those instruments for you to be your hands, your feet here on earth, and that we will not be apathetic, that we will not be weary from doing that work, but it will always be there. 
It will always be something that we have a heart and a desire to do. Father, we are in a time right now that is a, a little different uh, as a church body, as a society. Father, we just, we pray that every day we'll be reminded that you're in charge, that you are sovereign over all and that you are in control. And that no matter what obstacle we face, no matter what uh, hurdle we have to overcome, we, we have you and that is all we need. As always, Father, we are thankful for your son's sacrifice. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you'd reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are. Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign? Hosanna, Hosanna, 
Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. I'm hungry, and I'm thirsty. I'm hungry for bread. I'm hungry for the bread that Jesus called the bread of life, the bread from heaven, the bread that was broken so that I can have hope of eternal life. I'm thirsty for wine, wine that will give me life, wine that will allow me to be raised up on the last day, wine that is a new covenant poured out for my sins. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, and I know you are too. So now, in this sacred moment, eat the bread, drink the cup, believe in Jesus, remember his sacrifice, proclaim the Lord's death, and be full. Let's pray. God, may we remember that Jesus' body is the bread, his blood the wine, that fill us and that give us hope. Thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you for your son. In his name, amen. Scripture reading this morning will be from 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer do so. Therefore, if anyone in Christ is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. <clears throat> God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's stand together. Thank you. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a pathway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up. 
the same. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming. Like a bride waiting for her groom Will be a church ready for you Every heart longing for our King We sing, even so come Lord Jesus, come Even so come Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. So we wait. to come back so so either this is really great or nobody was listening last week so it's good it, it's really uh, really great to uh, to be with you again uh, to get to drive through the road construction uh, those things that build you up uh, by testing your character and your vocabulary uh, sometimes uh, but it's all very good. And I just love, uh, I love what this church sings and how it sings. It's just so sweet. My dad was a preacher and, and he told me when I was kind of starting, I, he said, now Eddie, you will find out that there's no way to preach good enough to make up for bad singing. <laughs> and if you got great singing, it won't matter how bad you preach. People will think they had a, had a, had a, good, a good time together. And so it's, uh, it's sweet. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, really, really sweet. Well, we're here again. For those of you who are, didn't, weren't here last week, my name's Eddie Sharp, and I help out with the... Um, work at Abilene Christian University in the Cyber Institute that works with churches that are in transition where their minister has moved some, somehow, some way, and, and they're going to be in the search for a, another minister. And so there is some need to kind of bridge that gap. And it's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very nice to be chosen to be in that gap because that gap preacher 
needs to be of such a nature that when the new preacher comes, everybody is really glad. <laughs> you see, you, there, there's, that, there's that deal of competence mixed with mediocrity that, uh, that I think is right in my wheelhouse. I, um, I think I was called early in life to be slightly a tick lower than ordinary. So that's good. Um, one person who uh, tolerates that uh, well is my wife, Annette, who came with me today. Uh, she's been um, holed up uh, in, in Dallas taking care of grandkids. And a lot of you have been doing that. How many of you have taken care of a grandchild in the past year? Bless your heart. How many of you have donated a child to be cared for <laughs> during the... Yeah. I, I, uh, I saw a sign yesterday that said, my wife and I decided not to have kids. Our children are really nervous. Uh, yes, uh, um, you ran into that. Well, it is a great privilege to be among the people of God. And nothing that's going on in this church right now changes the fact that you are a people called by God to be the people of God in the world. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We remember, maybe, or if you don't remember, I'm going to remind you, uh, nagging is the process of being reminded of something you haven't forgotten. So I'm going to tell you again what you haven't forgotten, perhaps from last week. That out of John 3, we said that the church was the church of the new birth. That the church was the church of the living Holy Spirit. That the church was the church of the kingdom of God. That the church was the church of the exalted Christ. That the church was the church of the light that is in the world. And so today, I want to pick up remembering some of that and taking us into 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is a letter that Paul the Apostle wrote. He wrote it to a church that could figure out almost every way possible to be trouble. People could get cross with e ways with each other. Uh, they could take each other to court. They could do all kinds of crazy things. They had misunderstandings about spiritual gifts and the resurrection and all kinds of things. And, and Paul treats them like the people of God. And, and by doing that says that the people of God may never, ever, ever get it all right. But they will always be the people of God in process. They will be moving forward. They will be being formed by the Spirit of God in them and with their lives in community formed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Getting there? No. Anybody perfect? Hardly. But all of us in community moving forward in that way. And so what, he, what Paul says in, in these uh, verses we're going to look at he begins in the beginning of chapter 5. He, he just comes out of chapter 4. Sorry, I, I may preach the whole thing and you don't want me to do that. But at the end of chapter 4, he's just said, though our bodies are wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed every day. And then he begins chapter 5 by saying, we have... In this world, this earthly tent, but in heaven, we have houses. We have spiritual houses. We're going to be blessed. We're going to be alive. We're going to be carried by the Father, by the blood of Jesus and the invigorating power of the Spirit from a mortal life to an immortal future. 
And, and then he, he says later, we have the Holy Spirit as the deposit of what is to come. When you became a Christian, God put the Holy Spirit in you as the first installment, the down payment of the eternal life. Are we going to go to heaven? Heaven has already come. Heaven has already begun in us. We're going to what has already started in us. And so the, the fellowship of the body of Christ is the fellowship of people all bearing the same spirit. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. And so one of the reasons that churches ought to be places of more harmony and more unity is that we all have the same spirit. And Paul continues then to get to the meat of where we want to go today. In chapter 14, he says something that always gets me. And when people ask me, what is your favorite verse? What is your verse that is the anchor verse for your life in ministry? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. And so you were going to get this sooner or later, so today's the day. But he says, this is sweet. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. We are a people who have experienced something truly amazing. We have experienced the love of God in Christ. And I think that's important because I learned how to do home Bible studies at one point in my life. And, and the home Bible study was a matter of looking up scriptures and finding the right answer. And it was all motivated out of the Bible is the inspired word of God, therefore you must do what it says. Let's look up the answers to these questions in Scripture, and then we'll ask you, are you willing to do what the Bible says? Now, that's not terrible. Some of you may have been taught that way. This was a way that it was done in churches of Christ. But at some point, it occurred to me that there was little, if anything, in this way of teaching people to obey the gospel, as we called it. There was little in this that said anything about Jesus or the love of God. It was a matter of getting the right answers to a certain set of questions and being obedient to a set of texts that had not done anything for you except said, listen to me. Now, I love the Bible. I love the inspired Word of God. I am preaching out of it today. But if you preach out of the Bible, it will not tell you to worship the Bible. It will point you to the overarching story that begins in creation and ends with the second coming, the overarching story of God's love for his creation expressed now completely in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, here I sit as a person with a body wasting away, inwardly be being renewed day by day, the Spirit of God is in me as the down payment of the life that will surely come and never end. And now I live this way. The love of Christ compels me. 
Now somebody in the back row goes, Brother Sharp, can you tell me what the love of Christ is? And somebody over here goes, that's stupid. That's a stupid question. And I go, but no. On the other hand, there's two ways of doing the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels me. The love that Christ has for me compels me. Do you know what it's like to be loved? Miss Annette is sitting right there. She loves me. She loves me. The love of Annette compels me. The love that she has for me. And so that's a part of this. The love that Christ has for me. At some point, some of you in a dark night, maybe some dark night in a pandemic world when you are isolated, you can't go to your friends, you can't go to the hospital, you can't be with the sick, you can't be with the dying, and it just feels terrible. Where do you lean? Where do you hide? Our only ultimate hiding place is to hide inside the knowledge that Christ loves us. He loves us. We're the sheep that he would go hunt for on a thousand hills. We're the coin he would sweep the house for to find. We're the, we're the child he would run down the road to welcome home. We are as sweet to him as Peter and Paul and Barnabas, the love of Christ. But then the love of Christ compels us. The love that I have for Jesus. The love that I have for Jesus. When I think of what God has done in Christ, if I, if I start in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and He's the Word. And, and then, then He says, uh, the only begotten one in the bosom of the Father. Hmm, has made him known. And, and then John says, uh, behold the Lamb of God. And, and then he's called a rabbi. Then he's called the Son of God. Then he calls himself the Son of Man. And I'm listening to what John's writing about Jesus. And, and this is, this is, a, this is a, a formidable person and then he's making water into wine. And then he's cleansing the temple. And then he's talking to Nicodemus. And then he's with the woman at the well. And then he's with the man who crippled at chapter 5 in the pool of Bethesda. And then in chapter 6, he's feeding the 5,000. He's the bread of life. And, and you hear word after word after word of this one who was sweet and good and compassionate and caring and offering a completely different kind of life. And then you see him turn his face toward Jerusalem and walk into Jerusalem and down the Palm Sunday Road into the Garden of Gethsemane. And at the end of that week, he is hanging on a cross and laid in a tomb. And then God raises him from the dead. And you hear him talking to the, the guys on the road to Emmaus. And you, you see him opening his hands to, to Thomas so he could put his hands in the scars. You, you see him in John 21 fixing breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. I love this Jesus. I love this Jesus. I love the Jesus who stops Saul on the road to Damascus and, and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I'm sure Saul said, I'm not persecuting you. I'm beating up on these folks. Well, those folks are me. Those folks are me. And Jesus, who had watched Saul consent to the, the stoning of Stephen, puts his arms around Saul and loves him. I love this Jesus. The love of Christ compels me. 
I wish you could just step into that, each one of you, that the love of Christ compels me. There are other bad com compulsions in the world. There are bad ways of being compelled. One of my favorite and fancy, kind of fancy story, but I want to make it fancy. There, there's a story written by a Russian author. His name is Dostoevsky. You don't have to spell it. But in this story, he has Jesus come back to about 14th century Spain. And Jesus walks in seeing how the, the church in 14th century Spain is acting. And Jesus walks in and the grand inquisitor walks out and confronts Jesus and says, Jesus, when you went to the mountain and were tempted by Satan, you said no. You said no to miracle. You said no to mystery. You said no to authority. And I just want you to know, once you left, we took it all back. And now we have power based on the secrets we hold. We have power based on the authority we hold. We have power based on the miracles we say we do. And now we rule in a way that you denied, but we accepted. And in this story, the Grand Inquisitor has Jesus put to death again. Well, somebody said, I don't like that story very much. You're not supposed to like that story. You're supposed to know that in many churches it happens again and again. We would rather not be led by a servant leader. We would like to be led by somebody who's got a little pizzazz, who is able to throw his weight around, who says he's somebody in the world. That's what we want. And most churches are supplied and I'll, these people will go to heaven, no doubt. Grace is grace. But, but there, there are people in church who should be in church and should be in Christ, but should not be leaders in Christ. Who should not be elders or preachers. Because all three of those things that the Grand Inquisitor took back just congeal into self-righteous arrogance. And frankly, I've been a preacher in a church or two where one of the leaders that I dealt with on a daily basis was a deeply arrogant, self-righteous person. And it is not what we call in preaching business fun. And so I want you to already set your mind as a church that what we're going to seek as a minister, what we're going to seek as, as leaders as you go forward in the life of this church, what we're going to seek are people who are compelled by the love of Jesus. That they're loved by Jesus and they love Jesus and they're not inoculated by the power virus, the authority virus, the arrogance virus, but have been vaccinated by the blood of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Because we understand that those who are compelled by the love of Christ know that Christ died for all, that all who would live for him would die in him. And having died in him, then would live for him. Do you remember, those of you who have been baptized in Christ, do you remember what it was like when the water broke over your face as you came up from the water? 
You just, you were down in the water, buried, and then you, you came up. You came up. Paul says that the reason that you come up from baptism, the reason you are not just drowned into heaven. Now, that'd been an interesting thing, wouldn't it? We'd like for people, everybody like to come, heaven, come down, we're going to half baptize you. We think, seeing you, that if you love Jesus and are washed in the blood of Jesus, you probably ought to just die there. That wasn't the, that wasn't the plan. The plan is that you're raised. You're raised to walk a life, a life that is predicated on the fact that you are already dead in Christ. And the life you've been raised to is not yours. It doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to Jesus now. You are walking with Jesus. And that changes everything. He says, so, so now we don't look at Jesus from a worldly point of view. We don't think of him just as a person who lived. We don't think of him just as a bunch of stories. Now we think of Jesus as we are now living in Jesus and Jesus is living by the Holy Spirit in us. So, so now we're living like this. I'm here and I'm looking at you, which is very nice, by the way. But it's as if I'm standing here in my own life and Jesus comes up from behind and Jesus walks into me. And suddenly Jesus is looking through my eyes. Suddenly Jesus has my memory. Suddenly Jesus has my hands and feet. Suddenly Jesus sneezes when he gets around Mountain Cedar. It's not all good. But suddenly now my life has been taken over, has been taken up into. Jesus has invaded my life and I am not my own. I am what he calls new creation. What is new creation? We are compelled by the love of Christ. Christ loves us. We love Christ. We have died in Christ so we live in Christ and now we are a new creation. What kind of church are we going to be? We're going to be a church full of people who are in the process of being newly formed, new creation. Why is that? Because people compelled by the love of Christ, living as new creation, little Christs in the world. We're Christians, we're little Christs in the world living as little Christs in the world, sacrificially living for the others, we have a job to do. And this gets fancy. Um, God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Let's just say, when people are, recon have you ever reconciled a checkbook? Some of you don't know what a checkbook is, but it's kind of like Venmo with an attitude. Um, but, when you rec rec reconcile a checkbook, you make the amount you think you have agree with the amount you actually have. Well, that's a good thing. Good thing. When you reconcile with someone that you're at odds with, you've been, you, you, said, you said something that just made somebody mad and y'all you, you work your way back together so that you can hunt and fish again. Or you might, pile in the car and go to Waco and go to the silos at Magnolia and, and, and buy, you know, something for the front porch. You could tolerate that again. Reconciled. That, that whatever 
human beings have been doing to put themselves at odds with the God who loves them and created them, that we're a part of the getting back together gang. We're a reconciling tribe of folks in the world who are working to put God and man back together, and we have a little part of that. God's moved heaven and earth, bringing Jesus into the world. God's moved heaven and earth, sending the Spirit into the world. But God has given us some stuff to do. When you think about your mission, you know, there are people thinking about what is the mission of the New Braunfels Church of Christ. Well, I don't know. Uh, to, to bring, to live the new creation life, to live the life in the kingdom of God, to live the life in the Spirit of God, to live life as one's lifting up Jesus Christ, live life in the light, to live the eternal life, to live life compelled by Jesus, to live life as those who are newly born for service in the world, to live life as a church of reconciliation. A church where people learn to get along with each other and become a model of what can happen in the whole community. That teachers and students love each other. <laughs> People from an a and &M can sit on the same row with people from UT. I'm talking the Spirit is powerful. All right? This is not just playing. The, the, the God is in serious business. The Republicans can sit down with the Democrats because there is a reconciling power in the world in Jesus that works in us, that is stronger than anything else in the world that tries to divide. And we stand up and say, in the very moment that Jesus was on the cross and was made to be sin on our behalf, God did all the work necessary to work against all the sin all the guilt, all the shame, all the anger, all the isolation. God has done a great work and now we are the ambassadors. He says, we work for the, the company. We work for the state of the kingdom of God and we're ambassadors in the world saying, what you need is to know the love of Christ. What you need to know is that Christ loves you and he invites you to love him. What you need to know is that you're invited to do a scary thing, die in Christ and be reborn in Christ. You can see the world in a completely different way. If you're tired of this creation, come to new creation. And we, as the body of Christ in the world, would like to bring you on the pathway of reconciliation. The love of Christ compels us. And we end up compelled all the way into reconciliation with God. So let me just suggest a couple of things. Each one will take approximately 40 minutes. <laughs> First of all, When churches are in transition, um, the devil takes advantage. And I don't want you to think about what the devil's doing in somebody else's life. I want you to think that, that in, during this period of transition, the, the, the D-E-B-I-L, the devil, is going to come whisper in your ear that something's terribly wrong and only you can write it. Uh, that, that somebody is, is a terrible person and that, that's a terrible thing. Or, or that somebody who is deeply arrogant and, and you know they're not, they're not, their heart's not in the right place for leadership and, and you're thinking, but, but we need somebody with that kind of gumption. Oh, 
know he'll keep us from gumption. So, so, so there's, there's that. Try to begin to pray that God will guard your heart against the temptations that come in a time of vacuum and transition. Okay? Second thing. If you have any broken relationships with anybody in this church, you might begin to try to move toward reconciliation. There might need to be some I'm sorry's or, or that, that thing that's really hard to say, you didn't hear me wrong. You heard me right. What I said was wrong. And I'm sorry. You may need to talk to somebody you've been avoiding for years. And I, and I don't want you to do this because I'm asking you to. I want you to do this because the love of Christ compels you. May it be so. Let's stand. The God of the heavens, the, of the, heavens, the ancient of days, the God of Yeah.
is our yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I 